deeper sense of contemplation emerges from the vision of a hill in the distance. The shepherd travels the countryside under the heavy agitated sky. The scholar-shaped structure reveals to us the man-made nature of this landscape, although it is completely covered by vegetation. This picturesque vision quickly fades, crushed by the weight of what has been erased and covered by the passing of time. This strange volcano is a tumulus. We are looking at the Sokol of Old Sarum, house of the first English parliament, birthplace of the kingdom's lords. It is history hidden under the landscape. Humans experience anxiety towards this appearance. This intrinsically human characteristic, the conscience of our own fatality, creates a struggle to survive, to preserve ourselves, and by extension our production. This struggle will turn slowly into an irrational desire of control, of order, of absolute domination. By putting mankind at the center of the universe, men of the Renaissance will create the necessary paradigm to trigger a fascination for our own exploits. Chosen by God, organizing the world will become our responsibility, our burden. In the remains of long-gone civilizations, nations uncover the traces of their own mythologies. Soon enough, this fantasy of genealogy will turn the ruins into sacred artifacts, supporting narratives of greatness and superiority. From the idealization and the spoliations of the antique, the fever of the collector state will have accumulated enough evidences to justify and believe in its own status of hair, and therefore its righteous desire of expansion. As the revolutionaries develop a national identity based on objectivity and progress, the glorious coronation of national heritage will ultimately mean its own death. As a stone and mortar Macbeth, the weight of representation will start secluding the monuments from their contexts, and what was once an intricate conversation of layers becomes tyranny. What was once the celebration of relations to which this architecture was committed across time and space becomes just like the museum, the demonstration of cultural radiance. And contemporary pilgrims will come, oblivious to the drama unfolding under their very eyes, and marvel at the loneliness of artifacts rendered meaningless by the rigidity of scientific history. It is all in the leaflet. Trying to rebel against the violence of this emotional and physical emptiness, people have attempted to reveal the concealed complexities of the historic layers under the carpet of modernism. Arguing that the fertile ground for an architectural Trojan horse would not be the monuments themselves, but their surroundings. Yet, they were too late. Monuments have invisible effects which we notice when their fragility affects us. In the face of ruin, we are reminded of our own. What will remain of us? How will the stories be told? These words are those of people without monuments. The forgotten ones of history? Ceci tuera cela. In collective imagination, Versailles is certainly the most eloquent display of power in France. Yet, even there, monuments cannot remain. An artist's permanent installation, stolen for its pure silver cladding, will have only its printed edition as a trace of its presence. The covered figures, where their names taken away with the silver, will now remain silent, anonymous. The forest of Fontainebleau hosts an homage to this disgraceful event, this time scattered through its meandrous paths. 
in the 20,000 acres labyrinth of oaks, pines, beeches, and other resinous trees, the harm at work is hardly visible. The ink disease, caused by a plant pathogen, putrefies trees from the inside. It starts from the chestnut trees and soon will spread into the forest. As its spread is accelerated by global warming, there is nothing we can do. The forest of Fontainebleau was the first piece of nature protected as heritage. Now, trying to save the diversity of ecosystems within the forest, time capsules are installed every two kilometers at the intersections of pathways. This network of sealed stainless steel and lead vaults will carry seeds and soil from a hopeless present into the future. 290 kilometers north, the migrants of Calais organize themselves to resist erasure. In a few weeks, they will all be taken away. No clandestine structures will remain, nothing which is overground. Nobody is sure what will happen to them. We are told that before going, some people want to leave a trace of their passage here buried in the ground. They tell us many put the few things they have inside the lead boxes. To some, letting go is the only way to keep. This photograph is the only evidence there is of the existence of the boxes. Nobody knows where they are anymore. A different type of deconstruction happened in Marseille. The city is founded in 800 BCE and becomes a major port by the 15th century. Yet, it is its 20th century heritage which the city is trying to forget. Marseille hosted two colonial exhibitions, and after two world wars, the remains of the imperial ideology are still visible today. Against imperialism and nationalism, we meet some people there taking matter into their own hands. We got in touch with an association building an itinerant structure, a space which will house forever personal artifacts chosen by individuals, forming through accumulation an inaccessible collective memory. Their participative design process is completed by a systematic archiving an archive which remains openly accessible. This way, they say, the objects they seek to build are not an end, but a means to initiate conversations and civic involvement. Yet, as they will manage to build a first structure, it seems they will have to face a force of opposition. They tell us they are glad, the archive is safe. The sheep are slowly disappearing from the potassium mines, since no one is interested in taking care of them. In this region of Alsace, it is the landscape which is taking over the city. The terrils are hills formed by the excavation of potassium, and as they grow, the city will get slowly eaten up, until there is nothing worth mining for. As they will gradually desert the place, the miners will try to record their progressive and steady departure from the territory which they have created. Inspired by Thomas Edison, they devise a machine recording touch, translating it into sound, engraved on a sheet of tin foil within a sealed chamber. The cylinder makes a full revolution every year, engraving a meter-long line. After a thousand years, 
the whole cylinder will be engraved as it goes down in a spiral and we will read the progressive exile from the transforming territory. Now that the device is done, the miners are not quite sure where to place it. The terraces are getting covered by vegetation, the factories collapse and the mines cave in. In the end, the miners will decide that the landscape is already a sufficient trace, which can perhaps be observed for much longer when the sheep will come back. What I try to achieve with this work is to make a proposal to rethink the way we approach history through a project of architecture. So this project of architecture is not just a solution to a problem which is presented, but is more a series of experiments led through the year. And in the end, these experiments are tied together in a fictional narrative of history. In this way, it is this very narrative that I present in this video, which becomes the project. And as an architectural project about monumentality, it becomes a container for a memory of memory, if you want. To remember, to remember, this was the key. Then the format that it takes is a video which is 10 minutes long, and in this way it sits between the commercial and the short film. What's interesting about commercial is that they are generally less than a minute long, because after a minute you start to have to tell the truth about what it is you're presenting. And in this way, being 10 minutes long, I start to push the boundary of what is presented as fiction and what is presented as truth. And in this way, I was interested in turning the viewer into a believer through this tension. And this question of belief is quite central to the project, because it's central to the artifacts which I'm presenting, such as the reliquaries, the things included in the cathedrals, etc., which give the value of the objects I'm presenting. Also, the belief that objects can live longer than ourselves, in fact, we can uh, preserve ourselves through these objects. I present myself more as, a, as an archaeologist and covering the facts of the past. I present myself also like an historian because his store is uh, the witness. It's also the investigator. Just uh, investigating history would be a way to approach it as an archaeologist or historian, but I take the position of the architect from the moment I start to narrate these facts at the future tense. And therefore, I project things into the future, and that becomes the position of the architect. The bigger issue for me through this project, I think, and the central part of it was that through questioning the way we approach history, I try to bring back together into the narrative discourse of history, so fiction, people who were left out of this narrative, people who were forgotten or didn't have the chance to have a voice. And in this sense, I wanted to give these people a certain autonomy. So I say that they organize themselves to build these monuments, to build these artifacts. And in a way, they don't need the kind of top-down view of someone who would organize a project, which would, you would expect from such an approach. In this sense, taking care of something and bringing together people who were left out was important for me from the beginning. It's probably also one of the most important skills that I think I have acquired at EA, or at least that EA proposes, which is a way to lead an investigation with a certain methodology and then being able to present this investigation in a way which is uh, critical and precise so that it can create an open conversation and not just propose a solution to something. And what I try to do in this is precisely uh, that position, which is the one, to the one who creates this conversation, enabling people to join it. And that was the key aspect of the project uh, for me.